Hi, this is Michael Imperioli. I play Christopher Moltisante on The Sopranos. And from time to time, I also write for the show. This is one of the episodes I've written called The Telltale Mozzarella. I like having the Twin Towers, seeing those. I mean, it's kind of a memorial to them, and I like seeing them in the beginning of our show. Well, the title kind of refers to Edgar Allan Poe, obviously, the Telltale Mozzarella. Actually, Mozzarella, which is the cheese that's on pizza, can also be kind of a, a not-so-nice uh, euphemism for an Italian guy. So it could kind of refer to Jackie Jr. because of the lies that he tells. It's kind of a dismal landscape, which makes sense for the show. <laughs> it's not very romantic. I think we actually shot a lot more of footage with adding some of the other characters. Like he drives by like us in front of the pork store and stuff like that, but I think they made, made the right decision just making it uh, all about Tony's point of view. And this is his, it goes good with the song. This is his morning, like he's driving to work. You know, what's on his mind? What, what does he have to do today? I think it works really well. There's some beautiful spots in it, like the road going up to his house. He operates between those worlds. Some of it's very cold and industrial. And some of it's wealthy and upscale like this. So you're about to see Telltale Mozzarella. Sit back, relax, and here it is. In this scene, Tony gives her a birthday gift. And Tony's in the middle of this affair, so this is kind of his way of relieving himself of the guilt because he thinks he's being this great husband. He buys this really expensive gift. So even though he is having an affair, he can convince himself that he still loves his wife and still makes her happy. And she, on the other hand, knows where this ring came from, that it came through his business, which entails a lot of, obviously, illegal things. And she accepts it. And it's another reminder of how Carmela is complicit in her husband's affairs and complicit in this, you know, mafia lifestyle. I think she struggles sometimes feeling uh, hypocritical about, but there are times when she willingly does accept it. But it's wasteful to the environment. Thank you, young man. Yeah, AJ already watched The Matrix. He bought that for himself, really, and watched it now. He's giving it to his mom. The Matrix? I haven't seen it yet. What up, O'Reilly? Hello? And Meadow, in this scene, she doing? sees the ring, and she kind of almost hints, oh, you must be feeling guilty, Dad, and that's why you're buying that ring. She remarks on the size of it, you know. Big ring. There's a little like hint like she knows something's up. There's some kind of some kind of maneuver Tony's trying to make to uh you know, to connect with his wife. She just knows something's up there. It's in Soho. My friend Bathsheba says it's awesome. I think David just has a great eye for casting. And it's been consistent over the years. I mean he just really picks the right people for the role. Pretty much he tries to cast Italians. The Soprano kids are an Italian. Jamie Lynn Sigler and Robert Eiler, but they they don't necessarily have to be because they're almost influenced by this modern world around them. They're 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 modern kids. They're not like like Christopher kind of grew up among Italian Americans, where these kids, the Soprano kids, grew up around all different nationalities. No bitch for me. I started writing when I was like 20. You know, I was already an actor, and I wrote things for like years. Screenplay ideas, plays, you know, short story, you know, stuff like that. I had a huge stack of stuff, like four feet high. And one day I threw it all away, like when I was like 30. I just thought it was all garbage. I never finished anything. I think I was more in love with the idea of being a writer than actually being a writer. I had nothing really to say. So I threw it all away. I said, this is all garbage. And then it kind of freed me up, thinking, well, there may be some things... You have to say, that means something to you. So I got involved with the Summer of Sam project with Victor Caliccio, who was my partner on that, and eventually Spike Lee. And that became the first thing I finished. And after that, I, I started another screenplay with another friend of mine, which hasn't been produced yet. And at the time, I was working on Sopranos. We had done the first season. And uh, in between the first and second seasons, I wrote a spec script about Christopher ODing on drugs and having this out-of-body afterlife experience. And David liked it. And he said, actually, in the second season, we're having you get shot so we could use this 
after death experience within that and within that what, what, what interests me after the first season i said it'll be interesting to explore how these characters look at the afterlife you know what are they're all catholic and what are the repercussions as far as catholicism if any do they have any in their mind how do they how do they fit what they do into the scheme of catholicism so that was from the second season from where to eternity this was more of an assignment coming on as a writer saying well this is the episode this is where it falls in the season and you work with the writers to come up with a, an outline and then you go and write it i'm much better as a collaborator i really like working with someone else another writer or you know uh sopranos is a collaboration for me you know to work with david and work with the other writers i find that you know i like that i like being part of a team the lollipop actually was the name of a a club that uh, a guy I grew up with, his cousin, owned this club in uh, New Rochelle. It doesn't exist anymore. It was one of the first clubs I got into as a kid. And it turned out that Vinnie Pastor actually owned the club before my friend's cousin. So it's the lollipop, and Adriana renames it the Crazy Horse, which is the name of Vinnie Pastor's other club that he owned in New Rochelle. So that's where those names came from. That's a club called Tequila Joe's in, um, it's in Newark. It's a big club. We do quite a few locations, a few days out of the week, every week. Which I, is great, you know. It's really great going to the, to the source. In the pilot episode, I don't even know if Adriana was playing Adriana. She looked a lot different. She looked a lot more... I don't know, upscale, more not not as a flat, not as flashy as Adriana is. And when they we came back and started shooting the first season, they had this character Adriana and Andrea De Matteo audition for it, and they just really, they really loved her. That character I think was inspired by her. I mean, it wasn't written as a big character in the beginning, and because of what she brought to it, I think um, David and the writers really expanded it into something, you know, and the relationship we have you know, made it a bigger part of the story based on her, you know, acting and her, her great work. The movie Tony's watching, by the way, is called It's a Gift, the great W.C. Fields. David Chase is a big W.C. Fields fan. So now we have Carmela kind of thinking about where this ring came from and more importantly, why he bought it for her. She's not really that much concerned that it came through his mafia dealings and is dealing with that she is kind of suspecting that he's done something that he feels guilty about, and that's why he bought such an expensive, flashy gift. But then she doesn't want to really believe that, so she lets it pass. The casting people for The Sopranos, two of the best casting people in the business, George Ann Walken and Sheila Jaffe. I had done a play that they cast maybe 10 years ago, and a couple of independent movies along the way. Trees Lounge, that Steve Buscemi directed. On the Run, that independent movie I did with John Ventimiglia. Any kind of young Italian guy, they'd always bring me in for an audition. So I met David Chase. I thought he was really bored by me and that I wasn't getting it because usually when you audition for someone and they give you direction, it means, well, you think it means as an actor because it's such an intimidating thing to audition for somebody. They give you direction, you think you're not getting it. And he kept giving me direction. I said, I'm, I'm sinking here. I'm, I'm just not getting it. He's been on his best behavior lately. I can't deny that. I just never... And then I got a call and they said, they um, want you to fly to Los Angeles to audition for the network. I was very shocked. I just didn't uh, think that they were interested, but they were. So I flew out to L.A., they put you in a hotel, and then you have to perform a couple of scenes in a little screening room, you know, uh, for about 15 people, I guess. And I did that, and I got the part. Now, this moment's interesting, where Tony kind of likes the idea of Jackie being Meadows' boyfriend, because he's one of them, you know, from the neighborhood, from the, you know, friends of the family, and Carmela doesn't like it, and it kind of, as Tony learns about her, these uh, situations and attitudes get kind of reversed between Tony and Carmela. You never know what an actor is going to bring to a character. 
especially on, on a TV show where you build as you go along. You know, you go from season to season, and during the season you do 10 shows. An actor can really define how you're going to write a character. What an actor brings to it, their own idiosyncrasies, be it their own or be it the ones they're playing for their character, can really inspire you to take them in different directions. I mean, I, when I wrote From Where to Eternity, I really wanted to write for Tony Sirico's character. Just something about his character, something about him, I get a big kick out of. I wanted to find interesting situations for him to be in. I think what an actor can bring can really inspire you as a writer to, to expand a character. You could start off not having maybe a big part on a show, but if you're doing such great work, you know, the writers will take that and expand it into something big. This was shot in, um, I think this is Harrison High School in New Jersey, this scene. AJ is lost here. I mean, he's like every other teenager. At a certain age, you try to find your identity. Some, some kids are leaders, some kids are followers, some kids are in between and do both, but you're trying to fit in with the people you want to fit in with. You don't, you know, you, you're trying to get along with girls. It's just a lot of things that are, that, that are going on, and uh, you wind up doing stupid things. <laughs> it happens. I don't remember specifically what episode Jackie Jr. was... Uh, introduced him but it was somewhere in the second season and he comes into this third season as an interesting character because he's kind of between tony and meadow meadow they had all these expectations to be this you know cultured columbia university student and now she's kind of coming back to jersey hanging out with this guy from the neighborhood which is exactly she's kind of hanging out with a guy like tony is but they don't like it but tony's kind of in between a lot of this, the drama in the family takes place right here, you know? During breakfast, during dinner. It's an Italian thing. Anything of any seriousness has to happen at the kitchen table. It's about food, it's about home, family. So David had this great eye, and he put this great cast together, and, and wrote this great pilot, and we had this great time doing it, and we said, absolutely no way in the world could this thing ever get picked up. We're having too much fun. It's too strange for TV. It's just not something that I can't imagine people watching. It's just too idi I thought it was the humor was too idiosyncratic. I thought it was too like specific to like the tri-state New York area. It's shot in New Jersey, which I, I don't think any producers are going to want to, you know, continue on. So we just thought, well, it was great while it lasted and forget about it. And when a couple of months later, we found out the show got picked up. We were really surprised, I mean, really pleasantly surprised, but we were shocked. And then when the show premiered and um, was received with this incredible acclaim and, um, you know, viewer response and, and, and ratings and stuff, we were even more shocked. This is the, uh, the investigation of the pizza. That's where the title comes from, the Telltale Mozzarella. Now, this old Italian guy is based on kind of a couple of guys from, like, my neighborhood, from where I grew up. These guys who had a lot of pride in what they did, these old Italian, you know, the guy who, who took care of his front yard and he had a great lawn and, a, and, and we were kids and would run over his grass and he'd come out and say, I'm going to put my foot up a UA, so that guy, I'll, you know, that kind of that kind of guy who, that's what he's based on. I knew a couple of guys like that. The pizza maker's able to tell who, who ordered that pizza, he, you know, he, he can figure out what are the ingredients and know which customer orders that combination of ingredients. That's where the title comes from, the Telltale Mozzarella. Here Anthony's getting, you know, he's in big trouble because they did this, they really messed the school up, you know, caused a big problem and banged things around, but they did it for no reason. It's just like crazy kid stuff. They just, one thing led to another thing and all of a sudden they start smashing stuff. It's just that misdirected teenage whatever, angst or whatever it is. It's not that he even hates the school or was trying for revenge. They were just like, as a goof, like he says, for no reason. It doesn't really make sense, but it happens. I knew it was going to be a great show, but I had no idea that it would be a success. I mean, it's kind of, it's the kind of thing where you feel like it's just, I mean, at the point when I did this, I wasn't such a fan of the state of television. I mean, there really there wasn't a lot on TV that interested me, besides The Simpsons, really, to be honest. 
And I just felt like mediocrity was rising to the surface in TV, and, and, and this was anything but mediocre. And for that reason, would not make it. You just thought it was almost too good to be true. You know, in writing for the characters, I think there's also part of you, you're writing for these actors that you've grown to just have a lot of affection for. They've become your friends. So you're, you're, you're writing for them and you're writing for the characters, and sometimes those lines get a little blurry. Like, you know, Stevie Van Zandt is going to eat up this line just because you know it. I mean, you know him playing Silvio is going to just bite into this. You know, John Ventimiglia, if you give him this to do, because I know Johnny so well and I know what... I have an idea of what he's going to do with the character. You know, you give him this piece of business, he's going to, like... He's going to, you know, hit it out of the park. I mean, that that is a lot of fun. Burrata is an Italian cheese, and he, they serve it with string beans, which is a dish I had at Ago Restaurant in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a restaurant owned by Robert De Niro, actually. Managed by Paulie Herman, who played Beansy on The Sopranos. And he recommended that dish to me when I was at Ago's, and I thought I'd put it into uh, into this episode. John Ventimiglia, who plays Arthur, and Sharon Angela, who plays Rosalie. The three of us were in the same acting class, like, uh, going back 16 years. We studied the same teacher, so I know those guys forever. We were all in On the Run, an independent movie directed by Bruno Dalmeida. I did a lot of theater with both Johnny and Sharon over the years. So it's great to be on the show together. It's just, and it just kind of worked out that way. It wasn't, wasn't like a planned thing or anything. It's been amazing to work with people that you grew up with, kind of, you know. I've known John since I was 17 years old. We were roommates at one time, you know. We've done a lot of stuff together, a lot of work. And Sharon also. This episode, I really like the relationship between Tony and um, Gloria, played by Annabella Sciorra, who I think was just the best choice in the world to play Gloria. I'm, I can't imagine anybody doing that part but her. She's a great actress. I worked with her a couple of times. The first, I played her brother in Jungle Fever, so I know her for a long time. I'm not sure if she was cast or not before I wrote the episode, but... Um, when I found out she was cast to play Glory, I was, I was like, oh, this is perfect. She represents a bit of a challenge to Tony. Tony's used to, you know, he has Carmela on one hand, who's become, you know, the Madonna side of it, the mother to his children, his, you know, his caretaker, his housewife. On the other side, he had the Gumars, like the, you know, the Russian girl Irina, or he had these, you know, these flings with women who really don't represent any kind of intellectual or emotional challenge to him, pretty much. And this woman, Gloria, comes who's smart, who's independent, who looks at the world a little differently than he does, and he's really into her. So he's all of a sudden on different ground than he's been on before, and I, I, I found that really interesting. His mother was very controlling, Tony's mother, Livia. You know, Carmela has a bit of that, and Melfi has a bit of that, and that's, you know, part of the attraction, I think. They have both male and female sex organs. This little riff about snakes and poly walnuts, he's, uh, he's always full of unexpected uh, gems of information, and uh, this is one of the things I like writing for him about. Jackie Jr. is on a bad track here, we can see. He's, uh, he's over his head. He mentioned Shea Josephine in this scene, which is a restaurant I used to work at way back. It's on 42nd Street. It's owned by Jean-Claude Baker, who's the adopted son of Josephine Baker. And when I was the waiter there, Harry Connick used to play the piano there. Now I go there as a customer. It's a great place. So when they, this episode aired... Jean-Claude Diona got calls from everybody all over the world calling him up saying, I heard your restaurant mentioned on The Sopranos. So Jackie's just getting in over his head here. He's, um, 
He's not cut out to be a mob guy. He's not his father, you know, and he's not Tony. You know, I only want the best for her. He would have been much better off staying in college and becoming whatever, a doctor or a fashion designer like he has aspirations for, but he, he just gets sucked into this world, and it's, um, it's not a good place for him. The worst thing that he does is he busts up this card game that belongs to Ralphie, he shoots the dealer, and everything goes awry from there. He's trying to make his bones, and he doesn't know what he's doing. Tony's looking out for Jackie Jr., you know. Uh, one is respect to his father, who was his good friend. I think Tony knows he's not cut out to be a mob guy, and he's trying to keep him away from it. And as he, as he sees him drifting into it, he, just, he knows it's a mistake. This is a band, um, well, in the show they're called the Miami Relatives, but in real life they're a band called Scout, New York band. Um, actually, I introduced them at a benefit. I had seen them play before and I really liked them. And by chance, David Chase had gotten a tape of theirs and um, liked them for this, for this part, so that was kind of cool. I like John Ventimiglia in this scene. He's uh, <laughs> out of control trying to recapture his youth. He, he's starting to wear an earring now, and uh, he's, you know, getting separated from his wife, and he's all drunk. And David's a huge music fan. And then you have the Stevie Van Zandt connection, because he's involved, you know, in the show, obviously, and uh, he brings his, his knowledge of music to it. I think he's done some work on soundtrack stuff, both having his songs and soundtracks and suggesting music. David's a big rock and roll fan, so so that's always played a big part. Matouche, the drug dealer here, he's um, playing a drug dealer who was always selling ecstasy in this club, and now we've moved in and we don't want him in there. We'll probably wind up selling our own stuff or something like that. What's up for you? I think they had to go to California to shoot this scene, to be honest. I think it's a zoo in, like, near L.A. or something. But this scene's great because, she's, you know, she's talking about... You know, she's talking about her ideas about the animals, you know, the eyes of the animals, the innocence, uh, you know. She's just... She's interesting to him, you know. She decides to go to the zoo. She doesn't want, you know... And at the same time, she's reeling him in. He finds his Buddhist symbol that she wears around her neck and he immediately tosses it off as oh god it's like my sister Janice who's a nut job and the Buddhist and but he kind of hears her a little bit she talks a little bit about Buddhism and we see it later on when he talks to Melfi he hears it but he uses it for his own benefit to justify his own things but it's it's just all about her challenging him but this is a big thing for Tony I think to be involved with a woman this way Annabella Shore brings something really special, absolutely. She's a real challenge to him. She's really, she's strong. She doesn't give up her own personality to please him or to, to have him, you know, fall for her. She's, uh, she's her own person. If he gets it, good, and if he doesn't, too bad. It is kind of out of character for him to fall for someone like this. He doesn't want a wife. He doesn't want those kind of, you know, conflicts. He wants a good mom who's just going to kind of not represent any challenge, just kind of like do what she's told, basically, and be a pretty face and, you know, have sex with him when he wants it. But it shows another side to him, and he's a complex character, you know, and, and uh, we keep discovering new things about him, and, and this relationship brings out a lot. She's got him wrapped around his finger right here at this point. She, he's just like... Totally nuts about her. You lie. The scenes between Tony and Gloria here, I mean, are really fun. Just the seduction. Her kind of talking about her, like, philosophies of life. This sex scene here, you know, just the way it kind of happens, the way she... She's just, like, luring him along, and uh, she knows exactly what buttons to push. She knows what to wear, how to look. She's a very sexy character. You know, you could see why he, he's just falling for her completely. A white albino python in the background. 
He was a good actor, that Python. Knew exactly what to do, understand. So Jackie's doing his best Michael Corleone here. That's with the finger to the side of the face and the, you know. He's playing the role of Michael Corleone in this scene. He's, he's the big shot here, you know, solving these little problems. He's using all the right words and the, uh, it's just almost like he's, he's doing this in front of the mirror, but uh, unfortunately he's doing it in real life. This scene, a policy that demands the immediate expulsion. where the principal and the uh, and the coach are kind of, this is like power brokering here, you know. They have a strict no tolerance policy for vandalism, but yet Tony's a big donator to the school. AJ's doing good on football, so they bend the rules a little bit. This is this is how Tony's world works. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. He's brought his GPA up to a C minus. So what is and Carmela can't stand the hypocrisy. You better wipe that smile off your face. Edie has Carmela down completely. She does. Look, I told him he's going to be off the team. You know, now... Uh, She's a great character to write for. It's not only skill that Anthony has shown. Because she sees the truth, you know, and she's not afraid to... Uh, she's not afraid to act upon it. And she knows herself very well, too, I think. And she knows when she hides behind a lie or, you know, bends her morals for her own benefit. And I can't say... She's faced with a big dilemma that she's faced with the reality that she's complicit in these activities that her husband's involved in, these things that are, to her, immoral and sins and knowing that they're illegal, but yet she benefits from them, and she knows she does, and she's admitting that to herself. What about the nightmares? None. It is, it is kind of very uh, jarring to see someone else sitting across from Dr. Melfi. It was a great opportunity, you know, for Melfi's character, too, now to... Um, show her techniques and, and her professional skills working with someone else, a woman. There's a little bit of jealousy here. She knows that, or suspecting at least, that Tony and, and Gloria have hooked up. She's a little angry that she doesn't know what's going on, but I think she's a little jealous that uh, Gloria is getting something that maybe she was, you know, was interested in a bit. I think she's excited. I mean, Melfi's excited by Tony. I, I I don't think she'd ever sleep with him or necessarily even really wants to, but there's just that, there's a tension. And now that Gloria, who's her other patient, is seeing Tony, the jealousy's not necessarily logical that, like, you're taking my boyfriend away or someone I want to have sex with. But it's just, it's more of a sense of proprietary or something that... Uh, The lines are blurred here, you know, as far as boundaries, and, and I think it makes for interesting drama and tension. Stevie Van Zant playing Silvio Dante, giving his tips on uh, the nightclub business. One of my favorite characters, Silvio Dante. The thing that keeps me going as a writer, probably the thing I'll always write about, is about a person's struggle with themselves. Basically, between good and evil, in a sense, between the dark and the light, between those two forces, and how you navigate through those things. Wanting to be as good a person as you can, and at the same time having temptations and having your faults and falling off mark and missing your mark, but picking yourself up and trying to go on. And that struggle, I find really interesting. Jackie Jr. is now trying to broker a deal between me, or my, or my character, Christopher, and um, his friends. He's playing the, this is another part of his mob guy routine. And Chris just doesn't give him an inch. Chris just wields his uh, being made status over him and doesn't, you know, he's a rookie and he's not really giving him any respect at all. I think Jackie would have been a lot better off if he had more of a mentor to take him into the business. And Ralphie's not a good mentor for him, and it doesn't really take him under his wing, but Jackie Jr. is a renegade, and he's trying to make his bones on his own, and he doesn't really know what to do, you know? Christopher has the benefit of Tony being his mentor, taking him through this 
you know, the, the levels of becoming a wise guy. And uh, it's a big difference. You got a lot of balls. Christopher tells him you got some balls, and that is his downfall. Jackie's downfall because he's got too much balls. He's being too selfish. There are similarities between Christopher and Jackie Jr. When Christopher started out in the beginning of the show, absolutely, but Jackie doesn't have the benefit of mentoring like a big brother. One of the great things about this show is that your characters evolve. I think the worst thing imaginable would be to be a character on a TV show and the audience and the writers write the same things for you week after week. You're, you're known as the this character and that's all you are and you got to do the same gags and the same routines and stuff. And Christopher's been able to evolve from the beginning. You know, he was really, you know, a kid when we started this and now after being made, he's... He's accepting responsibility and he's dealing with. He still makes his mistakes, big ones, and it's still. That's the way it is. I'll see you. You know, he's not totally matured, but he's on. You know, it's developing as he goes, and 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 that's interesting. So now Jackie wants a piece of his action because he went out and did a favor for the guy. I think there's more of a similarity between what I would write for theater and how I would approach, or how I do approach writing for film and The Sopranos. There's a big similarity because I think they all strive for the same level of drama. My goal in the next few years is to open a theater, a small theater in New York, where if I write a one-act play or a friend of mine or someone I know, you know, writes one up, we can just get a couple of actors together, a little bit of a set, get some people down to look at it, you know, rehearse it a bit and get some people to look, you know, to be able to have that immediacy of just getting up and doing something. I mean, to do a movie takes millions of dollars and a big crew and to do a TV show, the same thing, but you can workshop a play for, you know, not a lot of money and not, not involving a lot of logistics and other people. And, um, that immediacy, you know, to be able to like just find a project, you want to work on it, let's work on it. Anthony Jr. has no clue what the gunners are. He doesn't. He never had to worry about him before. Jackie's trying, Jackie, who did, really did nothing for this guy except get him in trouble, was trying to cover his ass and figure out what happened, what went wrong. Jackie doesn't even want to touch his bedpan. <laughs> You get the nurse to help you. That's what they get paid for. Joey Pants. Being a little bit of a father figure here. Not much, though. He winds up giving him a gun in this scene, which is really kind of the, the worst thing he could have done. But at least he gives him some pasta making tips, here, you know. I actually read this in, in the Rayo's cookbook. <laughs> Frank Pellegrino, who plays Kubatozo, the FBI guy. The pasta's just about cooked, and then you put it in the pot with the sauce and a little bit of... I don't know if he puts butter. I put a little butter in there. And then you stir it up with the heat so the sauce gets into the pasta. It works. Try it at home. <laughs> Ralph with the apron on there. I love it. Giving him a gun. It's hysterical. Joey Pants' character is a big hothead. You can have this one. I got another one under the bed. Not very stable. How much I owe you for it? Get out of here. Joe Pantaleone fit immediately right into this cast, this group. He's, he was uh, like we were waiting for him to come, you know, since we started. He was just a perfect addition to the cast. He's just been around so long and has acted with every... He's been acting for like 30 years and just has acted with everybody, and I think... For him, if he was intimidated, there was no way you saw it. And he, he's very relaxed and uh, just fit in immediately, like he'd always been there. I love how Annabelle in this scene challenges him, saying this, that you're, you're in love with yourself, you're selfish. And he thinks he's... He thinks it's totally the opposite, that he lives for everyone else. But she's saying, no, you, you, you do things for people, but you get you have your cake and you eat it too. It's like, yeah, you're a married guy, you take care of your wife and kids, but you still get your affairs, you get to do whatever you want, you know, you get your gumars. She's a great foil for him. 
I like the way Gloria's character is unraveled over the course of the episodes that she's in. In this episode, we see her with Melfi and talking about nightmares and talking about, you know, Melfi mentions the, the love affair she's had in the past had gone awry and the suicide attempt. So now we're privy to the information and Tony's not, which is interesting. The audience is a little bit ahead of Tony here that we know she could be pretty unstable and has wanted to commit suicide. And Tony doesn't really, he kind of doesn't really know what he's completely getting into here. Now, if Tony knew what was going to happen down the road with her, he'd probably never let her hold that gun. You don't always know, as a writer, where this character's going to go. I don't think I did know where this character was going. You're more or less working off what happens before, but um, I didn't know where she was going to go in the end. I didn't know how volatile she really, you know, that potential for violence that she had. We kind of know now she's, a, she's unstable. So here we have a very happy Tony Soprano, you know, due to the affair he's having with Gloria. She's putting a smile on his face, and she is giving him some other ideas that he's not really familiar with, and here he kind of echoes them to Melfi. She senses a bit what may be going on. She knows that Gloria and Tony have met, uh, especially when he quotes this participating in the suffering of the world. I think she really kind of nails it home that they may be seeing each other. Maybe it was coming here. It's very presumptuous of us to think people are not going to get this humor. Like, it's kind of... I think it's because audiences have been really underestimated by TV networks, by the studios and stuff, and it's like people out there are a lot smarter than, than they've been given credit for. And I think they can deal with a lot of things. People are always afraid, oh, this is going to upset the blacks, and this is going to upset the Catholics, and this is going to upset the Jews, and this. And people actually have a lot more, as far as humor goes, they can, they can take a lot more than they give it credit for. On The Sopranos, we kind of insult every nationality, especially the Italians, and they love The Sopranos. They get that these are characters who have this way of looking at the world. They know the people creating the show are not racist. The characters have elements of racism. They have this way of looking at the world, and people, people get that. They can understand that. It's inspiring to know that you can do a show like The Sopranos or like a Six Feet Under where the format is not like everything we've been used to seeing on TV year after year, and it can hit a big audience. That's great to know that the parameters are getting wider with television. I mean, television's an amazing medium. You can reach so many people, millions of people in their home. You can get people hooked on a show where week after week they're interested in these characters. It's great that it's becoming more original, more thought-provoking, more, you know, more strange. It's great for a big audience to get this, you know, to tune in every week. This scene between Melfi and Tony is kind of similar to the scene we saw with Carmela before. He may feel a little bit guilty because he's hiding this affair from her. It's one of her clients. And at the end of the scene here, he gives her money. He gives her extra money. And it's a similar thing that he did with Carmela, trying to buy his way out of guilt. And Melfi, in turn, has this money in her hand, and her son needs money for books. Will she or won't she use that money for her son? Because maybe she feels like Carmela was like, okay, this is my reward for putting up with the lies and putting up with uh, dealing with Tony Soprano. That's kind of reflecting on Carmela and his relationship. And now she, Melfi has her son needs books, so she's probably, I think she, you don't see it, but I think she sends him the money. She says, you know what, fuck him, Here's take the money. <laughs> Use it for yourself. If he's going to throw it around like this and I got to put up with this lying and all this kind of garbage, go ahead. Use the money. I think this was Silver Cup, actually. I think this was built on the stage at Silver Cup. Now uh, Jackie's in trouble here because Tony warned him. Stay out of, you know, stay away from this type of world. Stay away from, the, you know... Stay away from this stuff, and he, he doesn't heed his advice. He's mad. Smart Tony and Carmelo's attitudes towards Jackie have changed. Tony knows the truth about Jackie Jr., that he is kind of heading in a direction Tony doesn't want him to go in. Tony and Carmela, their relationship is kind of reflecting Jackie Jr. and Meadows. 
Kind of because Jackie is doing exactly what Tony does to her. Jackie's taking Meta to a Broadway show. So on the surface, he seems like a good guy, but obviously there's other things going on underneath that Meta doesn't know, that Carmela doesn't know. But Tony knows the truth, and now he has changed his opinion of him. Tony's almost afraid that Meta would marry someone like himself, which is how he's kind of starting to see Jackie Jr. right now, you know. Someone who'd follow along in uh, the path that he's chosen. He doesn't want that for his daughter. I don't think he wants someone who does the things that he does to his own wife, to his daughter. And now Tony's not feeling not so good about him, and she is feeling good, so. But she doesn't know what he's been doing. There's AJ up on the roof. That was in the script, uh, you know, to end it with the leaves falling down, falling, you know. I don't get necessarily specific about the shots unless you're really making a certain point within the scene. It's not something that you do consistently throughout an episode. You are really specific about the content of what's being shot. Like, for instance, the leaves falling in that last frame there. So obviously the director's going to set up a shot where you see Tony looking out the window and you see the leaves. There are times when you say cut to close-up of the face because it's dramatically important to get in tight. But a lot of that stuff is left up to the directors. We use a lot of the same directors all the time, so there's grown a a really good synergy between the writers and the directors, and, and we're on the same page a lot. You have been watching The Telltale Mozzarella from season three of The Sopranos. This has been Michael Imperioli. Thanks for watching. I'd like to send out a thank you to David Chase for inventing us all in the first place. Take care. <laughs>